Welcome everyone to the next Gen4 International Forum webinar presentation. Today's presentation on a gas Sherenkov muon spectrometer for nuclear security applications will be presented by Dr. Bay. He is a distinguished staff fellow with Oak Ridge. Doing the introduction today is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the group leader of the Radiological Materials Group at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the chair of the Gen4 International Forum Education and Training Working Group. Patricia? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Bertha, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to have Dr. Jung Yung Bei with us today. He is the winner of the PGO PhD competition uh, during the 2021 American Nuclear Society Winter Meeting. Um, Dr. Bay recently completed his PhD as the, cool of, uh, as the School of Nuclear Engineering at Purdue University. So congratulations, Dr. Bay, and he will join uh, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory as a Eugene Wigner Distinguished Staff Fellow. His research uh, focuses on the development of a high-resolution fieldable muon spectrometer using multilayer pressurized gas Cherenkov radiators and its applications such as uh, muon tomography, nuclear security, spent nuclear fuel casks imaging. He earned his Master of Science degree in nuclear engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and his Bachelor of Science degree in nuclear and quantum engineering from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. He has also been nominated, awarded the Roy Post Foundation Scholarship American Nuclear Society and the KSEA Graduate Scholarships for his contribution to the safe management of nuclear materials. So without any delay, Dr. Bay, I'm going to give you the floor. Again, congratulations on receiving your PhD, being the winner of the American Nuclear Society Pitch Your PhD competition. And thank you for volunteering to give this webinar. All right. Um, all right. Thank you, Patricia, for your nice introduction for me, and then Berta for coordinating this awesome webinar. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. So. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is, again, Jung Hyun Bae, a Eugene Wigner Distinguished Staff Fellow at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, first of all, it is my great pleasure to introduce my thesis work through Gen for International Forum webinar. This thesis work has been, has been done when I was in School of, School of Nuclear Engineering at Purdue University. I really appreciate to you all to attend my presentation. Okay, so now let's let's move on to my presentation again the title of my presentation today is a gas chunk of muon spectrometer for nuclear security application um, here is the items we will discuss today first we will briefly introduce research motivation and problem statement and object research objectives in this chapter we will get some idea why we jump into this work and what we expect through this research and in chapter two, we will discuss about the concept and operational principle of our proposed mu spectrometer using gas Cherenkov radiators. After that, I will introduce our developed muon imaging algorithm, which includes muon momentum information beside muon scattering angle information. In chapter four, the implementation and research of spent nuclear fuel monitoring using momentum integrated muon tomography will be presented. After that, I will wrap up my presentation. Okay, let's move on to the to the introduction. Okay, um, here is our motivation to our research. Uh, muon tomography has been emerged as a promising one of promising non-invasive monitoring and imaging techniques, especially for large and dense materials. It is very possible because cosmic ray muons have very high energy than the traditional induced radiation source, such as X-rays and neutrons. Um, so it is about the 10 to the 9 to 12 electron volt versus 10 to the 3 to 6 electron volt. 
So, um, muon tomography already widely has been used for spent nuclear, spent nuclear fuel cask imaging, nuclear reactor, especially monitoring damage reactor core in Fukushima nuclear site, and nuclear material inspection in a cargo container, and even archaeology to find a hidden chamber in a Great Pyramid of Giza, or geotomography to investigate magma chamber underneath volcano to predict upcoming eruption. Um, as we have seen, muon tomography looks very promising. However, as you know, muon tomography is not yet the major imaging technique in nuclear industry. This is mainly because of naturally low cosmic ray muon flux, which is approximately 10,000 muons per square meter per minute. To maximize the utilizability of cosmic ray muon in muon tomography application, we need to measure muon momentum. So far, since we have no capability to measure muon momentum in the field, we used to use the average cosmic ray muon momentum for calculation, which is about three, which is about three to four giga electron volt per C. Even cosmic ray muon momentum has a wide energy spectrum, as you can see in Figure 1.1. Okay, then let's let me show you why measuring muon momentum is so important using an uh, so important uh, using a one example of nuclear material monitoring application. When muon interacts with matter, it is deflected due to multiple Coulomb interaction with electrons or nuclei. Figure 1.2 shows the scattering angle distribution of muons for steel, lead, and uranium. And the width of each angular distribution can be approximated using equation one, it, the, the equation shown in here. As you can expect, the width of multiple clone scattering angle distribution depends on material density, size, and muon momentum. The upper figure shows the oh, sorry. The upper figure shows the muon scattering angle distribution for steel, lead, and uranium again when muon energy is 3 GeV, giga electron volt. As expected, steel has the thinnest distribution and uranium has the widest distribution. However, I intentionally changed the muon energy for steel and uranium. The lower plot shows the muon scattering angle distribution when muon energy is 1 giga electron volt for forest steel and 10 GeV for uranium. As you can see, the results are totally flipped. Uranium has the widest, thinnest distribution and steel has the widest distribution. So the point of this example, the figure 1.2, is without measuring your momentum, the results can mislead us in, the, in identifying materials. Okay. <clears throat> okay, in the previous slide, we have discussed the importance of measuring muon momentum in the muon applications. So I briefly show you three existing techniques to measure muon momentum or muon spectrometers. First, we can use a magnetic to, magnetic to measure muon momentum or it is so-called magnetic muon spectrometer. It is the most accurate technique to measure muon momentum or measure particles momentum. In terms of measurement resolution, it is the best. However, it is not only requires a large magnet, magnet to bend muons, but also it changes the initial muon trajectories. It is not ideal in the purpose of muon muon tomography because the initial and finer muon trajectory uh, before and after the scattering in, within the material it is very important in the muon scattering tomography especially. Secondly, we have a time of flight technique. It's very simple and very straightforward and easy to couple with existing muon applications. However, it requires very sensitive timers and long distance to maximize the measurement resolution. The third example is Cherenkov ring imager. We can measure muon momentum by measuring the radius of Cherenkov ring. 
Its measurement resolution is pretty good. However, generally, the Rikid Tranquil Radiator is used to induce tranquil radiation and it is also very long distance to improve the resolution and need, it needs vast array of optical sensor to accurately reconstruct tranquil rings. Okay, so, um, so here is a very summary, very brief summary of our research objectives. So first, one, first one is a development of buildable mu spectrometer. So there are some requirements in our design, which are it must be easily coupled with existing muon tomography system, it must be compact, portable, and light. Also, it must have a compatible momentum measurement resolution and high accuracy. And it also has to preserve the incoming and outgoing muon trajectories. The second research objective of ours is to develop a momentum integrated imaging algorithm without increasing or without significantly increasing computational cost. The third objective is to improve muon tomography imaging resolution, of course, and reduce monitoring time in muon applications. Okay, now let's move on to the uh, to the development of our Trankov muon spectrometer. Okay, um, to develop our buildable Trankov muon spectrometer, we use two fundamental physics to develop two fundamental physics to develop our Trankov muon spectrometer. First one is Trankov effect, and second one is Lorentz Lorentz equation. As you all know, Cherkov radiation is only observed when a particle moves faster than the light in a given medium. In other words, there is a threshold condition to induce Cherkov radiation in a given medium. It depends on particle's velocity or momentum and refractive index of that medium. Here is the uh, here is the relationship between the muon threshold momentum and refractive index of the medium. The refractive index of gas medium can be changed by pressurizing and changing temperature according to the Lorentz 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 equation, which is shown in the third equation. And the formula between pressure and refractive index is shown in this equation. And we summarize when we summarize these two equations to show the relationship between the gas pressure and threshold momentum for muons in the last equation. Um, as you can see in this equation, we are able to choose the proper threshold momentum levels for muons by pressurizing the gas medium. Okay, so now please see the figure on your right, figure 2.1. This figure shows the operational principle of our Cherenkov muon spectrometer. In this example, we use five radiators, and they have threshold momentum levels from 0.1 to 5.0 GAB per, per C, respectively. And we simulate, simulated a single muon, a single muon momentum of 3.1 GAB per C, which is slightly greater than 3.0 GAB per C. And this muon passes all the radiator. In this example, the expect, uh, in this example only first four radiator emit the chunk of radiation because the actual muon momentum uh, 3.1 is slightly greater than 3.0 and the result the expected number of chunk of photon is shown in the bar graph below um, and obviously uh, the last two radiator has uh, will will not emit chunk of radiation and zero chunk of photon will be observed after that, we will we recorded a presence of Cherenkov radiation using photon detector. If the if these detectors are triggered or Cherenkov photons are detected, it will record one, otherwise zero. After the finer signal processing, our Cherenkov muon spectrometer correctly indicates the extra muon momentum range, which is greater than 3.0, but smaller smaller than 4.0 gap per C.
Okay. Uh, okay. Based. Uh, okay. So based on two physics I introduced in the previous slide, we design our Cherkovian spectrometer prototype. Um, in this model, we use one. Okay. So in this model, we use one solid radiator because it is it was not able to reach point threshold level of 0.1 gap per c using pressurized gas pressurized pressurized gas without condensation um <clears throat> in this model so there so so the right figure shows the visualized jamper simulation when when mil, when a mu momentum is 3.1 gap per c so as you have seen in the previous slide, only first four radiators emit the Trenkov radiation, which is which are shown in green in the right figure, which is figure 2.3. And the, obviously the last two radiators will not emit the Trenkov radiation. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and the size, um, and also it is noted the size is only 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.5 cubic meter, as you can see on your left, which is figure 2.2, and its weight is less than 10 kilogram because it's mainly made of gases. Okay. <clears throat> Um, however, you may see some outlier data in the in in the figure on your right, which is figure 2.3. So it so this is because the track of radiation is not the only one optical photon emission mechanism in this radiator. There are more. So we studied a little bit more about the optical photon emission mechanisms. Okay, so again, because not Okay, so as you have seen, because not our optical photons are emitted from chunk of radiation, we, we, we have investigated more about the optical photon emission in the gas medium or radiator in our work. Uh, obviously, first, there is a chunk of radiation, which is our desired optical signals. The light intensity is proportional to the particle momentum, refractive index, and length of the medium. Cherkov radiation has a directional light emission along the particle's path, as shown in the figure on your on your right, which is figure 2.4. Okay. Next optical. Next optical emission mechanism is scintillation. The photon intensity of scintillation is proportional to the energy rules of particle or muon in, in our work and length of the medium. Unlike chunk of radiation, the light emission direction of scintillation is uniform for all direction as you have you as you can see in figure 2.4 again. The okay. I'm sorry, it's a little slow, the bad internet connection. So uh, the next optical photon emission mechanism is transition radiation. Transition radiation can be emitted when a muon enters and exits the different medium, as you can see in the figure on your left. However, the expected transition radiation photon emission is very negligible when mu moment, momentum is low, small, uh, smaller than tera electron board level, and small number of boundaries. Okay, the last optical photon emission mechanism is track of radiation, however, by secondary electrons. Since muons can decay into electron within the medium, electrons can be emitted in the radiator. Uh, and also because the mass of electron is about 200 times lighter than that of muons, its chunk of threshold momentum level is also about 200 times lower than that of muons. Therefore, it is easier to emit chunk of radiation for electrons. 
um, in addition, we uh, in addition we also can a muon can be converted to electron by being captured by aluminum nucleus. The difference between muon decay uh, from decay from the muon to muon to electron capture muon to electron convert, conversion is to neutron it is the neutri neutrino will not be emitted when muon is converted to electron. It is very it is very rare event, and this is currently actively researched at Argo National Lab, Fermi Accel Accelerator Lab, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So it is not yet included in Gen 4 toolkit. So in sum, except the chunk of radiation by muons, all other optical photons are considered as noise. Okay, so among others, Cherenkov radiation and scintillation are two predominant optical photon emission mechanisms, as you can see in figure 2.5. Therefore, in our work, Cherenkov radiation is considered as our signal, and scintillation is considered as noise. Okay, um, to analyze the expected number of optical photons by Cherenkov radiation and scintillation, we generated 1.1 and 3.1 gap monoenergy energy muons for 100 times in Gen 4 simulation. Figure 2.6 shows the expected number of Cherenkov photons in our radiator. As expected, the number of recorded photons rapidly drop when extra muon momentum does not exceed the threshold level. Now, we added the result from the scintillation. In general, the number of optical photons from scintillation roughly depends on material density and muon momentum. So uh, the point of this figure is even with scintillation, the expected number of photons is sharply decreased when extra muon extra muon momentum does not exit this record level. From this result, we can refer that Cherenkov radiation can be utilized to measure muon momentum by measuring optical photon signals. Okay, um, next, figure 2.8 shows the expected number of optical photons as a function of muon momentum in each radiator. As you can see, the number of total Optical photon rapidly increase when mu momentum exceeds the stretch of momentum levels. So um, these results demonstrate the feasibility of our trunk of muon spectrometer. Um, here, figure 2.9 shows the result of classification rate as a function of mu momentum. Um, uh, the classification rate is a probability that our spectrometer correctly measures the extra muon momentum. And a discriminator is a nothing but logic function that uniformly deduct certain number of signals from all radiator during the signal processing in order to eliminate or cancel out the predictable noise signals. The research shows that uh, when we use a combination of various discriminator ever for various momentum range, the achievable mean classification rate is about 87% in our prototype. Um, <clears throat> so in order to demonstrate the feasibility of our uh, our charcoal muon spectrometer, we also tried, tried to reconstruct the cosmic ray muon spectrum using our prototype, which is has six radiator. Um, so cosmic ray muon spectrum was successfully reconstructed using six momentum levels, except the highest level, which is the mo rightmost bar graph. This is because all the muon momentum greater than five giga electron volt per C is categorized and accumulated in this level because our maximum measurable momentum level is 5.5, 5.0 gap per C. So, um, however, this maximum momentum level problem can be easily reserved by increasing the number of radiators. So, we increased, we have increased the number of radiator from six to 10 and 100. The left figure shows the reconstructed cosmic ray muon spectrum using 10 radiator radiators and right figure shows the result from 100 radiators. 
when we use 10 radiators, the absolute momentum resolution, abs absolute momentum measurement resolution is plus minus 0.5 gear per C. And the relative resolution was 21.33%. Also, when we use 100 radiators, the absolute momentum measurement resolution was plus minus 0.05 gap per C, and the relative resolution was 3.35%. However, it must be noted that the resolution is obviously improved by increasing the number of the radiators. However, if we increase the number of radiator within the limited over size, then the size of each radiator must be decreased. It means the signal to noise ratio will decrease. Therefore, the, functional, the functional, functionality of our muon spectrometer will be improved by increasing the number of radiator in terms of the resolution. However, it will negatively impact the accuracy. Therefore, we must find the balance within this trade-off in a given condition. Okay, so now let's let's move on to chapter three, which is an introduction of momentum integrated imaging algorithm. Um, to explicitly compare the difference between existing imaging algorithm and ours, we use a table and uh, please see figure 3.1. Our momentum integrated imaging algorithm has been developed based on POCA algorithm, uh, which POCA algorithm, which is point of closest approach algorithm, and we named it as MPOCA. Basically, we use a same method to locate the muon scattering angle position as shown in 3.2. However, we record different value in each voxel instead of zeta. Um, in POCA algorithm, a muon scattering angle value is recorded in a voxel. The muon scattering angle is computed using two folded muon muon detector, as you can see in Figure 3.3. Now, uh, let's see the result of our example of benchmarking using POCA algorithm. We can see the published simulation experiment result in result in figure 3.1. Uh, this experiment was performed by K.N. Borosdin et al. in 2003. And we tried to benchmark their work to demonstrate and uh, to verify our, our work. And here is our result. Okay, uh, here is our result. Okay, now let's move on to MPOCA algorithm, which is our imaging algorithm that includes the muon momentum information. Okay, so after some studies, we have developed a M value, which is shown in figure 3.5. As you can see, M value can be calculated using scattering angle and momentum. So figure 3. Point, so figure 3.6 shows the reconstructed image of four different materials, aluminum, lead, and radium, using our M poker algorithm. Uh, for comparison, I also added the result of image reconstruction construction using POCA algorithm. As you can see, M POCA improved the Im imaging algorithm significantly. Okay, so now let's move on to the muon, momentum integrated muon tomography. Okay, so figure 4.1 shows the overview of the implementation of our trample muon spectrometer in span nuclear fuel monitoring application. So left figure is the visualize our model in Gen 4. The right figure shows the overview of the placement of muon tracker. So the green, uh, the bluish, the the bluish plane is are the muon trackers on top and the bottom of the target object, which is the spent nuclear fuel cask, and then in between the upper muon trackers and spent nuclear fuel cask, we place in our trunk of muon spectrometer. In here, we can measure muon momentum simultaneously.
Okay, um, <clears throat> we simulated four scenarios in order to demonstrate uh, demonstrate our imaging algorithm, which is MPOC algorithm, as shown in figure 4.1. So fourth scenario is, of course, when all spent nuclear fuel assemblies are fully loaded, which is A. Other scenarios are part of spent nuclear fuel assemblies are missing. We try to get rid of two one and a half of fuel assemblies and analyze the result to find out and locate the missing fuel assemblies. Okay, um, figure 4.3 shows the muon scattering angle and M value distribution at the center at, at the central center of bundle of fuel assemblies are missing. Uh, at the center of bundle of fuel assemblies, there's no missing fuel assemblies. These figures are pretty straightforward. So more dense material exists, the scattering angle value and M value will have will have higher values, as you have seen in the bottom plot of figure uh, 4.3. Uh, figure 4.4 shows the cross-sectional images when two of your assemblies are missing two of the middle fuel assemblies are missing using POCA and MPOCA algorithm and 10, 100,000 and 1 million muons respectively. So the upper left figure shows the, uh, shows the, the reconstruct image when, a, when two fuel assemblies are missing using muons capturing tomography using 100,000 muons. And in other, uh, in, on the other hand, the the, the the lower left figure shows the reconstruct imaging using MMST, which is MPOC algorithm, momentum integrated muon scattering tomography using 100,000 muons. And the right figure, on the other hand, shows the uh, the reconstruct image using MST and MMST. However, we use 1 million muons. So obviously, the imaging resolution. Uh, was significantly improved when we used 10, uh, 10 more, 10 times more number of muons, and when we used the MMST rather than MST. So um, the right plot are the same plot that we have seen in the previous slide. However, two fuel assemblies are missing in the center. So due to the absence of fuel assemblies in the, cent in the center, you can observe a big dip or big drop in the center in both plot. However, um, when we use the M value plot, the, 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 the drop or dip is more obviously shown in the plot or clearly shown in the plot. Okay, so figure 4.5 show. So figure 4.5 shows the same result, uh, however, when one fuel assembly is missing. So we can easily locate the missing fuel assembly, either, either POCA algorithm and MPOCA algorithm, if when we use a 1 million muons. So uh, so obviously we can see the locate we can easily locate the the missing fuel assembly using using a, we can visually in, locate the missing fuel assembly using Im, reconstruct image and the plot on your right. Figure four point six shows the result when a half of fuel assembly is missing. Uh, unlike the previous slide, now it is very challenging to locate a missing fuel assembly using POCA algorithm even when we use 1 million muons. On the other hand, it is, it is pretty clear, clearly shown in the figure on the uh, your lower, lower right figure, which is when we use MPOC algorithm or MMST algorithm and 1 million muons. Um, <clears throat> So it is very noted to see there is a, the, the dip in, the, in this statistical analysis, we easily can see the dip when we use the M value, which is very challenging to identify. And it's, it's really hard to say there is a small dip 
uh, where a missing field assembly is there are located. Um, <clears throat> so it is okay. So we summarize our systemical analysis in two figure, as you can see in figure four point seven. Uh, the upper figure shows the result for muon scattering angle, which is Poch algorithm, and the lower figure shows the result from M value, which from M Poch algorithm. Okay, the scattering data, the scattering data represent the scattering angle and M value when two, one and a half your your assembly is missing. Obvious, obviously, they are located under the area that shaded in red, which represent values when fuel assemblies are fully loaded. Simply, the less overhead they are, the better performance it has. In addition, the value ranges of gas, of air gap, and concrete shielding are also included in figure 4.7. Uh, they have much lower value values than fuel assembly because their density is much lower than uranium. Unlike scattering angle plot in M value plot, concrete shielding and air gap are clearly separated. In general, overwrapping of each area or data set is represented as noise in imaging. As we have seen in the previous slide, reconstruct image resolution is improved when we use M POCA algorithm. So um, here is our summary and conclusion. So we developed a novel uh, muon spectrometer using a glass and pressurized carbon dioxide gas radiators. We met, we met most design requirement, which was introduced in our research objective. First, it must be easily coupled with existing muon tomography. So our answer is yes, it can be easily implemented by your by placing it between target object and muon trackers. So second, it must be compact, portable, and light. So our answer is yes, it is approximately one cubic meter large and less than 10 kilogram. So the next one is it must have compatible momentum measurement resolution and uh, a high accuracy. So our answer is again, yes, it has a approximately 3.35% and 21% and 21.33% when the number of radiators are 110 respectively. And its accuracy about 87%. So the last question we need to address it was, it must preserve incoming and outgoing mu trajectory. So our answer is again, yes, it barely interfere initial mu trajectory because it is mostly made of gas. However, it must be noted that although increase the number of the radiator improves the momentum measurement resolution, it will inevitably negatively impact the signal to noise ratio due to the decreased expected chunk of signals. Also, to measure high energy muon momentum, in our case, greater than 100 gap per C, very low gas pressure needs are required. Um, and next, we developed a and introduced M value, which mathematically integrate muon scattering angle value and momentum. This algorithm does not increase the computational cost because it was developed based on existing imaging algorithm. The image resolution is significantly improved when we use M POC algorithm when uh, compared with POC algorithm. So we also so uh, the result of spend nuclear fuel cask monitoring when two, one, and a half fuel is missing. We were able to find out and locate a missing a missing half fuel assembly using MPOCA, which was very challenging using POCA algorithm. So we significantly improved the imaging resolution and reduced scanning time to find the missing fuel assembly in a span nuclear fuel dry cask application. Okay, so um, here's our list of peer-reviewed publication for this relate, uh, related to our current works. And here is the, 
Here is the list of publication for oral poster presentation and conference proceedings. So here's first page and second page. Okay, so thank you for listening and watching my presentation. So if you have any question and comment, please uh, feel free to ask any question uh, using this discussion time. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. As questions are coming in, we'll take a quick look at the upcoming webinars that we have scheduled. In August, China's multi-purpose SMR ACP 100 design and project progress. In September, our presentation on the development of in-service inspection rules for sodium-cooled fast reactors using the system-based code concept. In October, sodium integral effect test loop for safety simulation and assessments, otherwise known as STELLA. And in November, visualization tool for comparing energy options. Give me just a second and I'm going to help you see the questions. Um, we do have some questions in. So the first one refers to slide 10. Um, so I think what, what might be best is to just go to slide 10 and take a look at that while we address that. Um, on slide 10, you labeled the bottom figure being at three different GEVC, but it appears to be only one value, like the top figure, but a different energy. Can you clarify and which energy it aligns with? Sure. Um, sure. Thank you for your question. So yes. So this figure. So I intentionally changed the uh, energy for uh, of muons for different materials. So in case of upper figure, I use the same momentum for muons to reconstruct this Gaussian distribution. So um, it is very straightforward. So in case of upper figure, so when we shoot or simulate the three gap muons for uh, uh, towards steel, then obviously the steel is lighter than rhenium or less dense than rhenium, then the, the distribution of scattering angle must be thinner than rhenium. So this is the key uh, parameter uh, to identify the material in muon application. However, without measuring muon momentum, or uh, let's assume we have uh, we have no idea what, uh, uh, how much energy muon has or uh, how, how much energy muon has when it enters. So that's why I cha intentionally changed the muon momentum for different material. So in this case, I use one gap muon for steel. It means because this muon has low energy or moves slowly, so it's scattered with large angle. So that's why steel has the widest angle distribution. On the other hand, I intentionally use very high muon momentum for rhenium because it moves fast or it, had, it has very high energy. So it, it scatters with less angle. So that's why rhenium has the thinnest uh, Gaussian distribution in lower figure. So of course, it is very dramatic example and it is not unrealistic. However, this figure, I prepared this example in order to show uh, the importance of measuring muon momentum, which, uh, which we don't have, we, we do not have that capability in the field application. So um, again, we can measure muon momentum in the lab. However, my point is, uh, so far, we have no capability to measure mu momentum in the field. So yeah, this slide uh, is just for design to explain why the measuring mu momentum is important. Thank you. Did I answer your question? So the next question refers to slides 39 through 41. And there are several questions associated with that. And the first mm -hmm. is, 
are these actual fuel SNF assembly measurements, that is measurements of an actual loaded spent fuel cask? And if not, what is actually modeled here? And if so, is this a field measurement done at ISFSI or how long does it take to, measure, to make this measurement? The fourth question is, if not of actual SNF, do you think the radiation in the field from the SNF will impact the measurements other than accumulating dose to the operator generating the measurement? Mm. So let me post that question and then let's advance up to slide 39 through 41 and give you a chance to explain about that. Okay. So that starts with 39 and, and you still have control. You can advance forward or back and talk to the slides. Do you see the question now? No. So in your question. Yeah. So okay. the so question was, are these actual fuel spent nuclear fuel assembly measurement? Actual loaded spent nuclear fuel cask. Um so okay, so my answer to this question is this is the simulation result. Uh so yeah, I will I want to uh, make sure all these so all this example and uh, the result of imaging construction was performed using GEM for simulation and uh, the imaging algorithm. So it is all based on simulation. Um, yeah, so actually this is the actual model. So we modeled the actual the commercial spent nuclear fuel design in our GEM for simulation. And are you trying to move it forward? Sure, I see it moving now. Okay. Sure, I can hear you clicking, but I it wasn't moving. But I, I see it moving now. Um. <clears throat> and the, the answer for the last question is uh. So the questioner asked the question, so does the background radiation such as, so so when the spent nuclear fuel cask is stored in the uh, the interim, the storage storage uh, storage place, then of course there are a little higher background radiation than the environment, just the, uh, the ambient environment. So the question is, does that a little higher radiation background will impact this image, uh, the non-destruct imaging uh, technique. So my answer is, um, of course, yes, of, of course, yes. However, it is less impacted by impacted than others because, um, as you have seen in my slide, so the energy of muon is way larger than the uh, than the traditional radiation. It's about uh, greater than uh, ten times or a uh, thousand times or 10,000 times higher than the traditional radiation source such as x-rays or neutrons. So it means, so we can easily uh, cut off or there we can easily uh, set the threshold level of uh, the radiation level because uh, the cosmic ray muon has way larger energy. So, uh, so we can easily cut off the background radiation by setting up the threshold energy level. So that is my answer to your last question. Thank you. The next question is, for the missing fuel assembly measurements, how many measurements do you expect need to be taken in the field? For example, how many angle measurements with your proposed system are needed for the incoming and outgoing muons? Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is, Great question. So in our application, we only measure in a single angle. So um, of, of course, when we when we uh, when we took the data for from the various angle, then the imaging resolution obviously will be increased, improved. However, in this example, uh, we only took uh, a one angle. 
So how long it will, so the another question is how long it will take. So as you may know, uh, the, the disadvantage of your tomography is it takes a long, it takes very long. So it, it will take about at least a couple of days and or it will take a weeks. So actually that is the motivation of our, uh, our research. So by utilizing the momentum information uh, beside the muon scattering, muon scattering information, so we believe we significantly reduce the scanning time. Of course, um, by, by utilizing the muon momentum information in the muon scattering tomography application, so either we can improve the imaging resolution or reduce the scanning time. In order to uh, in order to attain the same level of resolution using uh, without measuring muon momentum, but uh, with measuring muon momentum, so we expect uh, we can reduce the scanning time from uh, uh, weeks or uh, days or weeks to uh, hours or within a day. So that is our uh, the more specific research objective. Thank you. Are there any plans to take your system to perform an actual field measurement at an ISFSI? Um, uh, so my answer is yes. So I was at Purdue University, so we are building our uh, uh, mu uh, mu spectrometer in our lab. However, now I will join to the Oak Ridge National Lab and then I propose to continue my research work at Oak Ridge National Lab. So that's why I will join as a Eugene Wigner uh, Distinguished uh, Fellow, uh, as, as, as a fellow, so because they can support, to, uh, support my work. So I propose to build the actual muon mom, momentum integrated muon tomography system in the, uh, uh, in the, at the Oak Ridge National Lab. So yeah, I will, I will. I have the three-year plan at the Oak Ridge National Labs. So um, obviously, it includes uh, it includes to the test in the interim spinocular fear surgery site. So yeah, you can expect some result uh, soon in in three years. Great, thanks. Um, would it make sense to utilize an array of sensors to perform the measurements to speed up the measuring time? Um, so, should I understand your question correctly? So, are you asking, if you asking, so can we use uh, cosmic ray, uh, we, can we use muon beam instead of cosmic ray muon to foster the, to attain the result? So my answer is, so muon, Muon beam is now currently proposed and I think trying to build, trying to build at the Fermi National Lab. So we, they, uh, one of scientists reached reach out to me, reached out to us to collaborate uh, to build or propose the muon beam at the Fermi National Lab. So my answer is, yeah, there, there is no muon beam which can use in the field. Of course, they can be used in the lab. Uh, obviously, you may see in the CERN. However, um, my answer is there is no muon beam in the field. And so that's why we have to use a cosmic ray muon in order to utilize a muon tomography, uh, utilize muons in the muon tomography applications. Thank you. The next question is, I think you saw the muon data for Fukushima nuclear power plant. Is it possible to see more clearly the status inside Fukushima Daiichi uh, by your technique? Uh, my answer is yes. So um, I think you may know, so they use, so some scientists use to muon transmission tomography in order to see inside of the uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, reactor. So more more specifically, they use muon tomography in order to measure the amount of uh, the uh, the molten core, the amount of the molten core. So not 
specifically for imaging. So, so in muons, uh, in this exam, in this application, of course, so measuring muon momentum is uh, obviously very important because they did not they did not utilize the mu momentum information in order to get an get an idea about the amount of the molten core in Fukushima Daiichi reactor. So again, my answer is yes. So should we utilize the our fieldable charcoal mu spectrometer in Fukushima Daiichi uh, reactor uh, application? Then obviously we can get more accurate and and accurate and more uh, feasible data uh, I, I believe we can get more feasible and reliable data thank you um There's a comment, um, I can go ahead and post it, I think, that for your information, ORNL, Sandia, PNNL, and EPRI recently procured some commercial canisters for spent nuclear fuel, and it may be worthwhile to set up a test on one or more of these systems with mock fuel to, to test your system before going into the field with an actual spent nuclear uh, fuel system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Yeah, thank you. Was it In was it was slide, it question or comment? That was a that was a comment. Um, but the, uh, yeah. the next question is in your slides 39 through 41, do you assume the spent nuclear fuel is in a metal cask? Or a metal canister in, in a concrete overpack. Um, so let me move on to the to our photo. Is it moving for you? I don't think so. Okay, it's fine. So um, in our simulation, we did not model a uh, the we we did not model stainless steel. Uh, cask. So we only designed the overpack, the concrete overpack. So as you can see, so in between the uh, fuel assemblies, there's there's no nothing in between the fuel assemblies. So yes, so when we uh, when we elaborate our model, we need to uh, model a more uh, specific geometry of uh, geometry uh, inside of the spending fuel cask. So yes, my answer is we only design uh, a fuel spent nuclear fuel assembly in in the center, and then concrete overpacked uh, surrounded, uh, which surround the uh, spent nuclear fuel assemblies in the center. Thank you. So the follow-up question is, what will be the impact of a 3 8 inch to 5 8 inch thick stainless steel on those results, on the outer portion of the concrete? Mm -hmm. So is it question or? Yeah, it's asking what will be, what will the impact of 3 8 inch to 5 8 inch thick stainless steel mm -hmm. have on those results? Um, so, Okay, the obvious uh, obvious result we can obviously expect is, of course, the noise level will be in increased. So because uh, the, <clears throat> the 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 space between fuel nuclear fuel assemblies will be replaced by the steel, then of course the dense of steel is way larger than air gap. So the uh, yeah, so the noise level will be increased. However uh there is no reason we cannot identify or locate the missing fuel assembly in the simulation so yeah that is my answer so noise level will be increased however there will not there be impacted yeah there yeah that it will not be impacted much to locate or identify the missing fuel assemblies 
Thank you. Did you include any metal in your model, such as the canister or cask walls, basket structure, et cetera? Uh, my answer is no. So again, so uh, there are fuel, spent nuclear fuel assembly in the center, and then the concrete outside, the, uh, the concrete overpack outside of the spent nuclear fuel cask assembly or bundles. So there are only two uh two materials or three which uh, the air is filled in any empty space okay great thank you i don't see more comments or questions coming in so i'll take this opportunity to thank you um, Zheng Ying, for your presentation and taking the time to put things together. Congratulate you on your um, expertise. We look forward to seeing your bright future. I know that your name will be heard again um, in the scientific community in the nuclear world. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone who joined today's presentation. Um, Patricia, do you have any last closing thoughts? Uh, I'm echoing you, Berta. Thank you so much, Dr. B, for your expertise. Um, I think uh, we wish you the best at Oak Ridge National Lab, and we're looking forward uh, to see uh, your expertise uh, moving up and helping others in the nuclear energy sector. So thank you so much again, Dr. B. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, thank you, Patricia and Bert. So, yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.